Hare Krishna, my dear devotees. I will uh, sing the Nashinka prayers and then um, we have a rabbi from the Jewish tradition who is visiting and he has some questions that would be uh, uh, of interest to all of us. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a little background of, of who? Of, yeah, you can come here and stand. <laughs> no, 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 we're sharing it. That's okay. I'm Joe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Here. Wish I had something to give you. Well, shalom, everybody. Shalom in Hebrew is one way that we greet. The basic sense of the word is, it means hello, but it also means peace and wholeness. Because when we greet another person, another person who is broken, another person who is struggling, your presence, simply greeting them, being with them, offers them a wholeness that they didn't have before. So greeting another person with Haribol or however we greet, our presence actually brings peace and wholeness. So thank you for, for welcoming me and for greeting me. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, I, I'm a rabbi in the Jewish tradition. We call our leaders rabbis. The word itself means on one level, it means my teacher. So we have a person who is my teacher, an individual connection with somebody to help us walk through life and lead us into a better way of living. I am here today to learn more about your faith tradition, and I'm honored to be here with you. I have been at a few Hare Krishna temples before, but this is the first time I've had this type of an engagement or an opportunity. And from what I know of, of, of Eastern thought, we have much in common, but we are different paths. We follow different ways into that one God that we all believe in. And what I thought I was, would do today when I was asked to come up is I would help us understand maybe some of the areas that we we differ, but also areas that we probably share in common as far as God and our relationship and our connection with Him. So my, my first question, if that's okay, is in Judaism we also believe in one God. I'm not sure of the nature of the oneness in, in your tradition, if the many are manifestations of one, or if it is one God ultimately, or there are many gods. So that the first question I'd like to understand, is Krishna the prime God of many, or is, is he the singular dimension of God with many manifestations? Is it multiplicity? plurality or singularity with many manifestations or aspects? That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> well, in the Vedic tradition, there's one supreme God, uh, Krishna, but he also manifests himself in other forms forms, but they're still the same one Supreme God. Uh, in addition to the Supreme Godhead, there are 
devas or devatas, which we call uh, in English demigods. They are not God, but they are uh, powerful living entities who have been uh, entrusted with uh, important services in the universe. So, um, yeah, you might have heard of Shiva, Durga, Ganesh, and so on. So they are uh, devas or devatas or demigods. And their relationship with the supreme god or Krishna it is compared to, uh, you know, members of a cabinet with the uh, king. So, yeah, like uh, Brahma is in charge of creation, Shiva is in charge of destruction, Indra is in charge of rainfall, uh, Varuna is in charge of the waters, Vayu is in charge of the wind. So they are not the Supreme God, they are servants of the Supreme God. But because of their pious activities, they have been awarded with these uh, services in the uh, management of the universe. Are they physical beings that were exalted ultimately into a demigod status, or were they always spiritual beings? Yeah, they were, they were always demigods. But some, some, like Brahma, even Indra, they are posts, they're positions. So, um, of course, the duration of life is Brahma, of Brahma is very long. But, um, yes, a living, enti uh, a, a living entity, if he's pious enough, he can uh, occupy the post of Brahma or Indra. Whereas Shiva, he's, his own, he's in his own category. No one can become Shiva. He's considered sort of halfway between a living entity and the Supreme Godhead. He's in his own category. So is your understanding of the, the complexity of God, or the, is it a complexity of one or a multiplicity of many? I'm still not clear on that. In, in the Jewish tradition, we have an absolute, and there may be a difference here, I'm, I'm not sure. And then we'll try and understand a little more nuanced uh, dimension of each position. But in the Jewish faith, we have one, absolute, complete, it's a singularity. In fact, the mystics in the Jewish faith speak of it's an absolute and an infinite oneness. So there's an infinite dimension to that oneness, but it is an absolute oneness. So we can experience God infinitely through every different encounter in life if we have a heart that is open and a mind that is seeking and eyes that are searching for and ears that are willing to hear. But the oneness is absolutely foundational to the Jewish tradition. Everything is grounded in one, but just like a light going through a prism, it refracts, it breaks up white light into color. That oneness can manifest itself as distinct aspects, but it is always that one source that one source of mercy, that one source of love, that one source of creation, and that one source of life that is always calling us into relationship. But it is one that we can encounter through many different ways. How, how does that fit with your model of, of the divine personhood or personhoods of Krishna and the gods or the demigods? 
It's the same. It is. It's completely the same. Yeah, absolutely the same. So then, what does it mean that Krishna was born on this day? For us, God always was. The, one, one of the names of God, I'd love to know some other names or insights into the names, behind, the meaning behind the names of God, Krishna, Shiva, any Brahma. In, in Judaism, one of the names of God, he has many names for the one. But one of the names of God has the letters in it that represent the word, I'm getting a little grammatical and I'm sorry, but it's, uh, in grammar there's the verb to be, is, was, will be. One of the names of God in Judaism has the letters that make up is, present tense being, was, past tense being, and will be, future tense. So it's an infinite continuity of being, existential being, always was, always is, and always will be. That's one of the sacred names of God that we speak of. And there is no birth, there is no death, there is no incarnation, it simply always is and always will be and always was and we participate in that infinite dimension of God by worshiping, by praying, by living a holy life. What does it mean that Krishna was born if Krishna is the all-encompassing eternal God? Yes, well, uh, Krishna is never, Krishna is never born. He always was, he is, and he always will be. So what we are celebrating today uh, is his appearance day. And I'll explain what that means. So Krishna exists eternally. He exists eternally. Yes in his abode, the kingdom of God. But he comes into this world from time to time to uh, show people, you know, who he is and what he does, uh, to attract them to his divine personality and service. And when he appears, he chooses, uh, you know, very pure souls to act as his mother and father. But he's not born. Uh, but the example is given that the, the sun is always there. But at a certain time it appears to rise and a certain time it appears to set. But it's always there. So in the same way, it is, Krishna is always there, but at a certain time he appears to our vision on earth and then he disappears. And during that time, he... Of course, this is... Uh, but I think you might also have something like that in the Jewish tradition. But one can have different relationships with God. Of course, the, we're all servants of God, that's a given. But uh, one can have, uh, be in the mood of, a, just a, as a servant, one can be in the mood of a friend, one can be in the mood of a parent, and so Krishna uh, selects two very pure souls who are, have the mood of parental love and he appears as their son. But he always exists, it's just like a, a pastime. And what, exact, what, what exactly does pastime mean? Yes, pastime means I mean, the Sanskrit word is lila, 
and it means uh, something he does for his pleasure, not something that he's obliged to do. And what is the purpose of those pastimes as far as our lives? Is the, are they instructional? Are they... They're, they're actual. He actually yes, existed, yes. and the yes. events took place. Yes. But what is... Is there a symbolic dimension for us in life that we are to model, that we are to imitate, that we are to live by? Or is it simply the historic dimension of his existence at that time? Hmm. Yes, his... Uh, his appearance and activities are in instructive. And there's a very important verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattvataha chyakcha deham purna janma naiti mam eti sawarjuna. One who understands the transcendental nature of Krishna's appearance and activities in this world uh, never has to take birth again, uh, but attains to Krishna's, uh, goes to Krishna. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> I guess you could say the philosophical basis of that statement is that the, the soul is eternal and when the, when the soul leaves the body it goes somewhere and where it goes depends on the person's activities during life and thoughts at the time of death and in that way, one continues to transmigrate um, from one body to another in the material world. But if one thinks of Krishna at the time of death, then one doesn't have to take birth again in the material world, but goes to Krishna and lives with Krishna in the spiritual world. And that is, uh, you know, mukti or moksha, that is uh, liberation from the cycle of birth and death. Once we move beyond this plane, and we enter the next plane, assuming with that Krishna consciousness, is that a static existence then, simply in the presence of Krishna? Or is there an evolving, growing, awakening awareness of the infinite world or dimension that we are in? Are we growing still once we are beyond this plane? In the presence of Krishna, are we still growing in awareness of divine knowledge? Or are we simply present before and with the divine, and that's our eternal state. Well, when we go to Krishna and join him in the spiritual world, um, you know, Krishna is unlimited, and so our appreciation of him can also increase without limit. So, and that's so I would say it's not static, but it is dynamic. So are we as souls within, within this body and then beyond this body in the presence of either Krishna or in the incarnations that take place because we didn't have a life fully lived or rightly lived, is, is our soul, our, the non-material nature of our being, is that eternal or is that at some point generated in, in the past. Yeah, the, the soul is eternal. It has no beginning and no end. Um, sometimes we might say that uh, that we're created by God, but technically we're not created. 
but we always exist. But it's like the sun and the sun rays. Both exist simultaneously. Both are eternal, you know, in this example. But still, the sun is, uh, you could say, primary, and the sun rays are secondary. But they, they both exist simultaneously. And would we, do we partake in that infinite nature metaphorically with the sun as rays? Or are we, in a sense, also the divinity, since we're both in this model that you're speaking of, are we both divine, not having an aspect of the divine, but are we both equally divine since we are both eternal? Yes. The soul, uh, the soul is part and parcel of Krishna. Our souls, our individual yeah. souls. Okay. Yeah. And they have the same qualities as God, but in minute quantity. So it's a part of the infinite, if we can use that language? Yeah, we are. The individual soul is... Is an aspect of the infinite. Yeah, part and parcel. So we are, in, in part, Krishna, the universal Godhead? Yeah, but two, two things. One is, he is infinite and we are infinitesimal. Okay. And he is the master and we are the servants. Okay. And how, how do we work our way back into, as infinitesimal aspects of the infinite, how do we work our way back into the infinite? On this, in this life, on this plane, yeah. or on the many planes that we have to go through. Yeah, that's the most most important question. And uh, <clears throat> the answer is uh, through loving service to God. Now, uh, there are uh, different, you could say different stages in the practice, uh, because in the beginning we don't have love. I mean, we might have a sense of love, but we don't have uh, fully developed love. So, um, yeah, so this practice or process is called bhakti yoga. And uh, there's a whole science of bhakti yoga and um, anyway, so um, Krishna, Krishna appeared, what we're celebrating today, he appeared 5,000 years ago. But then he appeared again 500 years ago in the guise of a devotee to show us, show us how to be devotees. And that is uh, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. You've heard of? I've heard of Chaitanya, yes. Yeah. So Sri Krishna Chaitanya is Krishna, but in the role of a devotee. So he is, he is human, physically able to be touched, Oh yeah, spoken yeah. to. Yeah, he eats, he sleeps. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So he he appeared five hundred years ago, and he empowered one of his disciples named Rupa Goswami to um, explain the whole science of bhakti yoga. So Rupa Goswami wrote a book called Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that is the complete science of bhakti yoga. And Srila Prabhupada has given us a summary study of that book as the nectar of devotion. 
So that, if we follow that process, we um, uh, can become qualified by the Lord's mercy to, uh, to go to the Lord. That's the process, bhakti yoga. And what, one, what does bhakti mean in, I know we only have a few moments, but what is the foundation of, of bhakti, both in, terms of, both in terms of its etymology, the meaning of the word bhakti, and how does that manifest itself in our service so that we can come back to God? What is the way of bhakti in life? Yeah, bhakti means devotion, love and devotion. And um, one who practices bhakti is called a bhakta, devotee. And um, so when we follow this process of bhakti yoga, especially as explained by Rupa Goswami, we can um, perfect our lives and go back home, back to Godhead, and, and be with uh, Krishna, be with God. I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally not speaking much on the Jewish understanding of these ideas because I want to understand more on this sacred day, at this sacred time, your, your tradition. But, but I, I want to help, I want to, I want to understand, or this will help me understand in this one question, I'm going to bring up some Jewish dimensions to see are we on similar paths to the one or do we, are we on parallel paths that some way, sometimes part ways. Is Abhishek now? But Vaisheshika Prabhu is not back. Huh? Abhishek is scheduled at 5 to 6. No. Let's let, we'll do this first. We'll continue with this first. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Should we take a vote? Uh, that was my question. Oh. Uh, I want to I understand more how we make our way back into our ultimate connection with God, which is what we're all seeking. In the Jewish tradition, we live a life of service to both God and to our fellow human. And we do it through a series of ritual commandments or practices. The Hebrew word is mitzvah. So our ritual practices are called, our commandments are called mitzvahs or mitzvot. And that's what we do in the morning. We wear this or we wear certain garments or we say certain prayers or we, we live in certain ways with our fellow human being. But the root meaning of this word of living a life of commandment, the root word of commandment is the Hebrew word for to connect or to join. And in a broader context, it means joining something that was formerly whole, like a vase was whole, and it was broken but put back together, joined back together. So, again, the imagery uh, that I'm trying to express here is we have a vase that is whole, that was broken, and the pieces were put back together and made whole again. That word for to join those broken pieces back into that original wholeness is the Hebrew word that we use for commandment. Our ritual life, our commandments, are the way, metaphorically, that we come back to wholeness, that original wholeness that we had in life, which is the wholeness with God. Hmm. So we live a life here of holy living in service of others and in service of our Maker, to reconnect the broken parts of our being into that organic original wholeness. What does the devotee from your tradition do to regain that wholeness besides the, the offerings that I've seen here, the artis, 
or the, the bhakti, which I don't know how bhakti manifests itself in life. So what is the process of holy living in, in bhakti yoga? And is its ultimate purpose to rejoin you, connect you again with that original wholeness? To, to connect. And the English word yoke, like to yoke to oxen, comes from the word yoga. And so, yes, yoga, our, the goal of yoga is to uh, connect with God, to be, to be linked uh, to God. And it involves more than simply prayers or meditation or chanting. It involves engagement with our brothers and sisters in life. Yes, okay. very much so. could ask many more questions, but I, I know others also have <laughs> questions. Well, thank you. It was, we're honored to have you in our midst. Thank you. thank you all, and I'm honored to be here, and I look forward to learning more. Shalom. He's a rabbi. He's the leader of this local community. I'm visiting from... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.